فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد وان تفسير سوره التكوير the overthrowing الله سبحانه وتعالى هي سد واذا الموعوده سئلت باي ذنب قتلت we were speaking about this verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says and when the girl who was buried alive is asked for what sin she was killed why was she killed these verses in the Quran that speak about the killing of young girls this was a practice by the Arabs they used to do this before Islam and it is from the things that when Islam came it got rid of and it brought back women their rights inshallah ta'ala i'm going to bring some stories to your attention abdul razak ibn hammam al-san'ani he narrates in his musannaf that umar ibn al-khattab he said this verse came down regarding qais ibn asim he came to the prophet alayhi salatu wassalam he said ya rasul allah o messenger of allah i buried my daughter alive before islam came what i did as a sin was i buried my daughter alive the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said to him free every single daughter in which you have buried alive free on her a slave free a slave he said ya rasul allah i'm just a man who has a camel I don't have slaves I don't own slaves. Then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said slaughter a camel if for each girl that you you buried alive. The most shocking the most shocking story was the one Al Imam Ad-Darimi narrated in the beginning of his Sunan that a man came to the Prophet and he said ya Rasulullah before Islam we were worshippers of idols. We used to worship idols. We used to kill children. We used to bury our daughters alive. I used to have a daughter, he said. And when my daughter became a bit old in age, she became a bit older than she was, I told my daughter, Daddy, come, we're going to go out together. I told her mother to dress her up, to beautify her and get her ready. And so her mother did so. And then I told my daughter, come with me. She came. I stood her over a well and I said to her look down. So my daughter she looked down at the well and I pushed her from the back. She fell and she dropped into the well. And she said to me ya abata o oh father ya abata she called out to me. And the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as the story was being told to him he cried until the tears rolled from his eyes and it filled his bed. So this is what used to happen before Islam. They had stories of how they buried their daughters alive. And if Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala takes a religion away from a people, they can't come with morality through their logic and their intellects. Well, idalika das what brought honor back to women. The day of judgment, the woman is going to ask and she's going to say bi ayyi dhanbin qutilat. She is going to ask the one who killed her for what reason he killed her and she he won't have an answer for why he did that crime Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he then says wa idha as-suhuf nushirat and when the pages are made public that day the scrolls in which people's deeds were written on people's actions the papers and the scrolls in which it's written on are going to be made public and every single person is going to know what they did allah is going to bring everything out yawma tubla as-sara'ir the day when the hidden will be made public allah says in another ayah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
it will be said to the person, Iqra, read, kitabaka your book, kafa bi nafsika liyawma alayka hasiba. Read your book. This is enough for you to busy yourself with. Don't look at anything else. This is enough for you to observe and to look and analyze. As Allah said in the ayah in Surah Al-Kahf, وَوُضِعَ الْكِتَابُ فَتَرَى الْمُجْرِمِينَ مُشْفِقِينَ مِمَّا فِيهِ وَيَقُولُونَ يَا وَيْلَتَنَا مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرَةً إِلَّا أَحْصَاهَا وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا That everybody, their books will be placed in front of them. And everybody's going to look into their book. And when they look into it, they're going to see everything which they did. And so the thing that they're going to say is, مَا لِهَذَا الْكِتَابِ لَا يُغَادِرُ صَغِيرَةً وَلَا كَبِيرًا What is this book that hasn't left out little nor big? It had documented everything. Times that you forgot. Times that you thought to yourself, Oh, this is not going to be written for me. Oh, you were heedless about it when you did it. It's all there. He hasn't left anything out. What is this book that's doing this? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every word that we say today, ما يلفظ من قول إلا لديه رقيب عتيد Every single statement that comes out of your mouth and every single thing which you say is going to be documented, is going to be written for you. Some of the scholars, they took from that even the things that are not evil, that are not bad, will be written for you because you could have said something better. وَلِذَلِكَ عَطَاءِ بِنْ أَبِي رَبَاحِ He said, I never spoke, I never uttered a statement except I asked myself 70 times, is it worth saying it? Is it worth me saying it? I had that discussion with myself before those words came out of my mouth. Should I say it? Because once it comes, the scholars, they say, you control the statement before you let it out. But once you do, it controls you. How many situations have you been in where because of a statement you said, it's controlling your whole state of mind and your actions? Huh? I, I, I didn't mean it like that. Wallahi, my intention was this. You misunderstood me. And you have to explain yourself because of a statement you let loose. You are now put in a position where it controls your whole state of mind and your feeling. But once it's in your mouth and you haven't said it, you've got control over it. That's why the poet, he said, احفظ لسانك أيها الإنسان لا يلدغنك إنه ثعبان كم في المقابر من قتيل لسانه كان تهاب لقاه شجعان Protect your tongue. Safeguard your tongue. أيها الإنسان لا يلدغنك Don't let your tongue bite you like the scorpion. إنه ثعبان This is very a snake. Your tongue is lethal. Don't let it bite you. كم في المقابر من قتيل لسانه How many people have ended up in their grave because of a statement which they said? Because of a statement they said. They got into a fight. They got stabbed. They got killed because of a statement they said. So the statement is not a little thing. So every single body who believes in this ayah wa either suhuf nushirat, and that day everything is going to be made public, and everything which you did privately and publicly is going to be brought open, then you need to be scared. وَلِذَلِكَ الْإِمَامْ مُحَمَّدِ الْأَمِينِ الشَّنْقِيطِيُّ نَقَلَ الْإِجْمَاعِ He transmitted a consent that أَعْظَمُ وَاعِظٍ The greatest reminder a person can be reminded with is مُرَاقَبَةُ اللَّهِ إِجْمَاعِ عُلَمَاء قَرْنًا بَعْدَ قَرْنٍ Generation after generation They agreed that the greatest thing a person can say to you is Allah is observing you and Allah is looking over you There's nothing greater than that reminder To be said to that Allah is observing you subhanahu wa ta'ala And you have to ask yourself What is your situation going to be that day When you're being told اِقْرَأْ كِتَابَكَ كَفَى بِنَفْسِكَ الْيَوْمَ عَلَيْكَ حَسِيبًا what would your situation be? Ask yourself now, that day when I get given my book, what's going to be written there? A lot of us already know. That's why Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, حَاسِبُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تُحَاسَبُوا وَزِنُوهَا قَبْلَ أَنْ تُوزَنُوا Make sure that you account yourself before you're accounted. Before this day comes, you account yourself every night before you go to sleep. Scale yourself, weigh your actions and your deeds before it's weighed for you the day of judgment. That day, everything's going to be brought open. So it's scary. It's a worrying time. 
It's not a day that anything can be hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. يَعْلَمُ خَائِنَةَ الْأَعْيُنُ وَمَا تُخْفِي الصُّدُورِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَإِلَى السَّمَاءُ كُشِطَتْ And when the sky is stripped away. وَإِلَى السَّمَاءُ And when the sky كُشِطَتْ is stripped away. The word كُشِطَتْ, it means يُنزَعُ It's like stripping the sama. Just like the jild, the skin is peeled from the dhabiha, the animal that's slaughtered. When they slaughter it and they want to take the skin off, the way that they strip the skin off the animal, the sama, the sky will be stripped away like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be doing that. Mujahid ibn Jabri said that. That the word kushitat, it means a nuzi'at, it will be stripped away. And Allah mentioned it in many other places in the Quran. He says, The day in which we roll the sama, the way you scroll up a carpet. This is what's going to take place. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to do. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, And when hellfire is set a blaze, Jahannam is that Allah has made the heat of Jahannam rise greater than it was before. The har of Jahannam zadat, it increased in heat and hotness. That day Allah is going to do it. Jahannam already has eaten itself, remember that. That it complained about Allah. Jahannam has said that, oh Allah, I've ate myself. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made for Jahannam two times to breathe. One time is winter, and one time is summer. This is the times when Jahannam is breathing. So it was already hot, Jahannam. And, and its heat was great. But that day it would be made even more hotter. And it would be increased. وَإِذَا الْجَنَّةُ And when paradise, Jannah, Uzlifat is brought near. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring Jannah close. Jannah that has been pre prepared for who? The muttaqeen, the pious people. The people of taqwa has been prepared for them. Qurribat wa udniyat. It will be brought close, close to those pious people. This is what's going to happen that day. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa idha al jannatu. And when Jannah is brought near, uzlifat, is brought near. And this is the view taken by Rabi ibn Khuthaym. And it's a view attributed to uh, other Imams min Aymat al Mufassirin. And this is the view Ibn Jarir al Tabari chose in his tafsir. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, Alimat that day every soul will know ma ahdarat. It will know what it has done and it has previously achieved. Alimat, that day, every nafs, every individual will know what it has done and what effort it has put forward. You now know where your destiny lies. You now know where you're going to head. This ayah, alimat nafsu ma ahdarat, is the response, the jawab of ila shamsu kuwirat. All of this time Allah has been saying either and when, and when, and when, when what? What's the answer to this when? That day, when all of this happens, and Jahannam is made to be hotter than it is, and Jannah is brought close, and the scrolls and the pages in which deeds were written on is made public, that day everybody will know. Alimat nafsum ma ahabarat. Every single individual, whoever they are, they will know what they have put forward. Allah says in another ayah, يوم the day, تجد كل نفس ما عملت من خير محضرة. That day, every individual will know ما عملت what he has done من خير all the good that is done he will know it. محضرة it will be present in front of him. وما عملت من سوء and every evil in which it has put forward. It will know, tawaddu, it will wish that day. Law anna bainaha wa bainahu, he will wish 
if what he has come with is evil, if there could be a big distance between him and that evil which he has done. He would wish that the evil goes towards the east and he's on the west. He doesn't want to get close to him. But every, every individual will know that day. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, وَوَجَدُوا مَا عَمِلُوا حَاضِرًا وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا Every individual will know and be aware of that which it has done. And Allah does not oppress anybody. What is written in that scroll and what is written on that page is your deeds and what you put forward. No one has made this up. No one has added onto these pages. It's only a reflection of what you did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Qiyamah, يُنَبَّأُ الْإِنسَانُ Every individual will be informed يَوْمَئِذٍ that day بِمَا قَدَّمَ وَأَخَّرُ That which he had put forward and that which he delayed. Everything that you put forward and everything which you did, you'll be informed of it that day. So it's a day of recognition and knowledge of everything that we're going to be, that we're going to have. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he then says, فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ So I swear, by the retreating stars, فَلَا أُقُسِمُ بِالْخُنَّسِ The word khunnas here means what? The retreating stars. الْجَوَارِ الْكُنَّسِ Those that run their courses and disappear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he's swearing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can swear by whatever he wishes. فَعَالُ لِمَا يُرِيد Allah does whatever he wishes. لَا يُسْأَلُ عَمَّا يَفْعَلُ وَهُمْ يُسْأَلُونَ Allah is not asked what he did, why he does it. But you are asked what you did, why you did it. Allah can swear by anything. He can swear by his creation. He can swear by whatever he wishes. So Allah here, he swears by the retreating stars. Those stars that run their courses, those stars that come and they also disappear. Allah swears by them, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of the scholars, I mean the scholars of tafsir, they differed. Khilaf amongst themselves by what is meant by la uqsimu. What is meant by la uqsimu? I will not, because the la here is what? Is nafi, it's a negation. So what does it actually mean? The scholars of tafsir, they have three views regarding what is meant la uqsimu. The first view, it says, Nafyul lil qasam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is negating the swearing. He's actually saying that this matter is so clear that I won't need to swear by anything. That's what's meant by la uqsimu. The second view of scholars is that fala uqsimu here is the thing which Allah is swearing by is actually hidden. So it's the negation is not taken into consideration because the manfi is mahdhuf and yuqaddaru and it's hidden and what should be said is lay la laysa al-amru the matter is not kama za'amtum fil qurani the matter is not as you guys have claimed regarding the Quran. So what is being negated is your claim. Third view is that the la here is actually ta'kid. It's just an emphasis. It's just a emphasis. And that view, the last one, that it's ja'ali ta'kid, is the qawl which is sawab, which is correct. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَاللَّيْلِ And the night, إِذَا asa. The word as'asa, is from the Arabic words that have two opposite meanings in one. Some of the Arabic words, they have opposite meaning in one word. Such as the word wara. The word wara in Arabic, what does it mean? What is the word wara? Behind. What does it also mean? It also means in front. وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ مَلِكٌ يَأْخُذُ كُلَّ سَفِينَةٍ غَصْبًا Wara is a term that uses two opposite meanings. It can be behind and it can also be in front. Because Allah said in this ayah, وَكَانَ وَرَاءَهُمْ 
and there was in front of them a king who wanted to take these boats. You with me? So the wara here is in front. The word as as is when the night goes and when it comes. Both meanings. Either akbala or adbara, it can take both meanings. And both meanings can be used here at the same time. It's not a problem. Pay attention to this. That if the word is a laft which is mushtarak, it's a term that takes both of the two meanings. But you can use those two meanings at the same time. They are not talaq or they're not contradicting each other. Then it's not a problem. We can use it now here. But there's another part in the Quran or there's another word in the Quran which has two opposite meanings. We can't use both of, the, both, both of them at the same time. Which is ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ The word قُرْئِ أما قَرْئِ However you want to say it. It comes from the word طُهُر When it's purified. Or حيض When the woman's on her menses. And those two are two opposites. One is طَهَارَ And one is other than طَهَارَ But here if you use one, you can't use the other. But the word asa asa here, we can use both meanings. Adbara and Aqbala. Walayli and by the night. Ida as asa ida aqbala or adbara. When it comes or when it turns its back and it leaves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he swears by that. And Allah also swears by Wasubhi ida tanafas. And by the dawn when it breathes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is swearing by إِذَا بَزَغَ ضَوْءُ النَّهَارِ When the night, the dawn breaks. Have you guys ever come out after you come and you pray Fajr in the masjid? Have you ever come out and you seen the dawn breaking and the night leaving? The beauty and what Allah is subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is taking place? Allah is swearing by that. The darkness is going. The day is coming. Allah is saying, swearing by that subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are things that no one can do except him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ That indeed, the Qur'an is a word conveyed by the noble messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is telling us here, and he is swearing, that this Qur'an that we have today is a it's the word of Allah, but it's conveyed by the Messenger alayhi salatu was salam. That Nabiullah Muhammad, he conveyed this Qur'an on behalf of who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Qur'an here is, the statement is being attributed to the Prophet. And it's been said, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ Because he is the what? He is the conveyor on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If somebody builds this house today, or this masjid, are you with me? What we would say is, or if a leader builds a country, we will say he built this country. But he didn't physically come and build it, did he? But it's because of his command and his... The Qur'an is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. And the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the one who conveyed it on behalf of Allah. إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ That indeed the Qur'an is a word conveyed by a noble messenger. Nabiullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some of the Mufassirin, they said no. That what is being spoken about here is Jibreel. That the one who's conveying the Quran is Jibreel who's taking it from Allah and he's passing it over to Nabiullah Muhammad. Those two opinions are mentioned. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and it seems that Jibreel is more stronger because the verse to come later is talking about Jibreel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, ذِي قُوَّةٍ He is Jibreel, one who possesses power. ذِي قُوَّةٍ عِنْدَ لِلْعَرْشِ مَكِيمٍ And with the owner of the throne, secure in position. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, here this verse, we're told two characteristics of his. The first characteristic is that Jibreel is what? ذُو قُوَّةٍ Jibreel has what? The quwa. He has strength. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made him strong. That's what Allah said in the Quran. Allamahu shadeedul quwa. Nabi Muhammad was taught by 
the one who is strong and is powerful. Nabiullah Muhammad was taught by who? Jibreel. And Jibreel is very powerful. He's from the strongest angel Allah created subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows Shadidul Khalq. Jibreel is very strong in his creation. If he grabs, he can severely hurt a nation and a people. And what Allah is trying to tell us here is the responsibility of the Quran is it something very powerful? Jibreel is strong to carry it. Jibreel is a strong angel. He can fulfill the responsibility pertaining to the Quran because he has the quwa that is needed. And this is something we need to ponder here. What is it that Allah mentioned for Jibreel? The quwwatin inda lil arshi makin. And these, these characteristics of quwwa is what Umar ibn al Khattab. Radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he saw that Umar Abu Bakr was about to die, who did Umar say that has to who did Umar say has to be the successor after Abu Bakr? Who did he choose? Umar. He went to Abu Ubaid, Amr ibn Jarrah. He said, Ya Abu Ubaidah, you are the Amin of this Ummah, the most trustworthy person in this Ummah. So you need to take over the Khilafah after Abu Bakr. And then Abu Ubaidah looked at Umar and he said to him, You, on the other hand, are Qawiyun Ameen. Umar, you are strong and you are also what? And you are a person who is trustworthy. And you have a character for somebody to choose you, to be the leader. وَلِذَلِكَ If you ponder in the Qur'an, you find this characteristics of quwwah. Strength is praiseworthy. Which slave, of, which slave is most beloved to Allah? الْمُؤْمِنُ الْقَوِي خَيْرٌ وَأَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنُ الضَّعِيفِ وَفِي كُلِّ الْخَيْرِ The Prophet said that the believer who is strong is more beloved to Allah than the weak believer. And they both are good. But who's better? Who's greater? The strong believer. The strong believer, some people may think, is the one who sleeps in the gym, who spends 24 7 in the gym. No doubt that's a portion of the word quwa, no doubt. It falls under that as well. But the quwa here, first of all, means what? Al Iman. That's number one. You guys know the story of Nabiullah Musa. And when Nabi Allah Musa went, went to Median and he visited Median, Median, what did he see in Median? Wajada. He found and he came across Ummatan Yasqoon. He found a people who were doing suksaki. They were taking water with their buckets. And what did he find amongst the people standing around the well? Who what did he find? He found Two women. What is it that he did when he came? Nabi Allah Musa. He threw the bucket in for the women. Because these women would wait and they would be patient until the people would finish with taking the water and they would go home late because the men would do their stuff. The men would take all the, the water they wanted. And when the men left, these women would come and they would throw their buckets in and they would take the water and they would leave. Musa alayhi salatu salam, he made a journey fast for them. What did he do? He went in, he got them the water they needed, he passed it over to them. So the women, they went back to who? Their father. Some people, they say this is Shu'aib. Is it Shu'aib? Lam yasihha fi dhalika shayin. It's not Nabi Allah Shu'aib, no, no. It's a rajul salih, it's a righteous man, not Nabi Allah Shu'aib. It's incorrect to think it's Shu'aib. Ala kulli hal, ala kulli hal, Nabi Allah Musa, he st stayed where he was. The two women, one of them came back. But how did she come back when she came to Musa? Tamshi al istihya. She was walking shy. The girl, when she came back to Musa, she came back walking shy. Tamshi al istihya. And then she said to him, Inna abi yad'uka liyajziyak ajra ma saqayta lana. 
My father is calling you to reward you for what you've done for us. Sah? So what did Nabiullah Musa do? Nabiullah Musa, he went. And when Nabiullah Musa went and he met the father, what was the characteristics why Nabiullah Musa was married the woman off to? And why was he chosen to work for the man? What was the characteristics he had? Huh? She said to him, Qawiyun Amin. So if a sister is looking to marry a brother and she wants to know if this is the brother she should marry, what should she look at? If he's what? Qawi. If he's strong. Because it's that type of man that controls everything. Everything is running smooth. It's not the man when things collapse, he hides behind his wife. Yeah? It's the man who, when the calamity is before the family and hardship comes, what is he? He's sharp. He thinks, what should we do? How do we get out of this? And he's also a mean, he's reliable. These are the two characteristics a person is chosen for. Then Nabiullah, Muhammad's teacher, Jibreel, was what? Qawi. A strong person. That's what Allah has said. The first characteristic that's been told to us about Jibreel is what? The quwwatin inda dil arshi makin. He is, he possessed of power. And with the power and the owner of the throne. 